All right, so I want to teach you a bunch of different things in Scratch that just kind of finish Scratch off almost because we we know most of all the pieces, all the places that you could scroll to. We go to scratch.mit.edu. Might as well go there now. You know most of it. You know the blue things. All these we maybe played around with the with the sounds. We know events. We know control. All these fun. Things. There's a few places like my blocks we haven't seen yet, um, and then there's some also some events that don't really make sense yet. Broadcast. What does that mean? We'll talk about that today at least. So yeah, well, let's get started. Well, let's make it happen. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is the idea of cloning a sprite. So you, you can have one scratch cat by default on your uh, in your program, but there's like a there's a clone block that clones that sprite into a copy of itself. So let me find that first of all. Uh, is that in control? Yeah, so here it is. There's a block called create clone of myself. Isn't that cool? So if you run this, uh, as it runs in code, it will make a clone of that scratch cat. So like, if I click it, now there's two scratch cats, even though there's only one sprite called sprite one or scratch cat, whatever you want to call it. And then if you like do that a bunch of times, you click it a bunch, bunch of times, the original one is the one that cloned itself. So it's like that one. Now I've got a bunch of scratch cats on the uh, display, and they could all be doing their own little thing. That's the then control create clone of myself. This could also create a clone of some other sprite on the, in our list, but we only, we only got one right now. Okay, so for my silly example, what I'd like to do is let's make like a beautiful field of stars. Like we, we've got like a warp drive or something, and we're we're floating through the stars uh, on our spaceship. And so let's make 50 stars in random locations, random sizes and directions, and they'll just like bounce around like we're moving at warp speed. That'll be a fun example, I think. So let me just like start over. Let me get rid of the scratch cat for once. Sorry. Uh, and then I'll bring in a star. Okay. You can keep the scratch cat around if you want. But he, we're going to have outer space. I have one star and then a backdrop. Uh, there should just be like space, <laughs> space backdrop. Uh, there's that one. There's like a stars backdrop, but that's a cool one. Perfect. So I got one star sprite and then a, a cute little backdrop that it, uh, is setting the scene very well. All right. So what I'd like to do is, I don't know, when the green flag gets clicked, I guess, when the program begins, I would like to make 50 clones of this star because then I'll like have them in different spots. Yeah. I want to make 50 clones of this star. And so essentially I want to run this block, right? This create clone of myself block. I want to click it 50 times. And that just screams a loop, I hope, right? So I'm going to use a repeat loop uh, and just be like, repeat 50 times, create a clone of myself. You see how that'll create 50 clones? Does that make sense? So I'm just going to run that block 50 times, it'll make 50 clones of the star. So if I click it, it's doing its thing, it's making 50 clones, it takes a while. Uh, and then it's done, and we don't actually see the effect, do we? So uh, it did work. There are 50 stars, but they're all like on top of each other right now. I could just start moving them around. Uh, there are 50 here. Actually, 51 if you count the original. Uh, but that's not very useful, right? Because they're all in the same spot. You can click the stop button to like, kill all the clones. So now we're just back to the original one. So, yeah. Interesting. What can we do to fix that? So, all right. We got 50 stars. We'd like them to all just like be in random spots, right? That's the first thing. And so in addition to creating clones down here in control, there's also an event. When I myself, the star sprite, when I start as a clone, do something. You see how that'll start a program. All the clones can have their own little program that runs every time they begin their lives. And so that, that's what I like to hook into. So every time, like the original star, right? The original star is doing this. It is creating 50 clones of itself. And then all the cloned stars, I can have code run for them when they begin their lives. And so what do I want, what do I want every star to do as it begins its life? Well, I like it to just like warp to a random spot. Then I'd have stars in different places. Does that make sense? So let's do that. We And so now when I run it, I'm getting 50 stars in random locations. I do have the original one still sticking around. So there's technically 51. All right. And if you click stop, it goes back to normal. And if you try it again, they're, they're in the new 50 random locations. Any questions about that? Does that make enough sense? What's going on here? So this is a new, uh, new concept, cloning, and then you can have each clone do their own thing. That's pretty nice. Uh, all right, what else do I want? Let's make, I don't know, 
let's have them be in with random sizes, right? Random sizes and then also random directions because they're all like, uh, they're all copies of this, of this, this original one which kind of like pointing that way. Wouldn't it be nice for them to have like different directions, random directions? That'd be cool. So, all right. In addition to going to random position, point in a random direction. So like you, here's, here's you hard coding, like point in this particular direction. But we can say point in direction and then like shove, choose random number here. Remember that operator? So point in direction, I don't know, pick random between 0 and 360 or whatever. Yeah, that's pretty nice because then, like every time, it'll just be a random random number that's a, a direction. What is it? A degree amount. Okay, so now I have 50 stars and 50 random spots, and they're all kind of tilted. Isn't that nice? That's pretty cool. What else can we do with them? Uh, we can make them different sizes make them different sizes too. So let's also do that same thing of like picking a random size. And that should probably be in looks, yeah? So yeah, here it is. We got set size to a certain percentage. And again, we can choose a random number. So, all right, what should our size be? A random number between like, definitely 100% should be possible. Do we want to go down to 1%? I don't know if that's a good idea. We got some tiny stars. If we do that, maybe like 25 is a good min value. How about that? Looks good enough to me, yeah. So I got big stars and baby stars. Even that's a little small, maybe like 50 to 100. Let's see what, what happens there. I don't know, you gotta play around with it, honestly. That's that's the game. But yeah, that's, that's pretty cute. 35 to 100. Are there any questions about what's happening so far? So I'm making 50 clones of that original star, and I'm telling all the clones to do this. They got their own program running. Go to a random spot, get a random tilt to you, and then also set yourself to a random size, percentage-wise. You can technically go bigger, like 200%. You can go up and it doesn't have to stop at 100. So I encourage you to try that all the way to like 500%. Giant stars. <laughs> like you're about to burn up. So. Again, play around, it's fun. Um, but if we're good so far, the last kind of main thing I wanted to do is bounce around. All right, so every clone, what I want them to do, just like bounce around on the screen so like, this is like a warp drive or something. And so we'll have them just move in their current direction forever and like bounce off walls. Remember I was doing the same thing with the scratch cat, it's like bounce off and like hit the walls. So we'll just do that, all right? So all the clones, what do I want them to do when they begin their lives? Go to a random spot, tilt in a random direction, uh, get a random size, and then forever, after that, forever, until the end of time, just keep going. Keep going in your current direction, move 10 steps or whatever, and then if you ever hit the wall, bounce off. So it's this one, if on edge, bounce. All right, so that's what every clone should do. Forever, after you've like set everything else up, right, I'd like you to move in your current direction if you can, 10 steps. It might involve hitting a wall. If you do hit a wall, bounce off. All right, so that's exactly what we did with the Scratch Cat, and that will give us the following. Isn't that cute? That's a little too fast. I don't know. Uh, maybe 10 steps at a time is a little too much. So we can have it move two steps at a time. I don't know. That's a bit more nice. I'm not sure. Even go down to one step at a time. Even. Look at those floating stars. It's very cute. All right. So I like that. Um, what else could we do? I kind of don't like the original star sticking around anymore. Do you? Uh, do you? I don't know. Because, uh, like, you, you have the original star, its job is just to, like, give birth to 50 stars, essentially. And then it's just stuck there, right? That, that star in the middle. See it not moving? That's that's our original, like, grandfather star, all right? That's the one giving everybody else. It's creating clones of itself. And then all the clones are doing this. But that original star, it was just like, this is its program. It's it, All it did was create clones, and it's done, all right? So boring to have it just sit there. You could, I guess, you could copy this program into here for that original star. That, that's a possibility. Then you have 51 stars. Or um, maybe like its job is done after it's cloned itself. We can just like have it hide. That might be useful. All right. How about that? So that's in looks, I assume. So like, let's hide that original one when it's done. So now look at it there. And it goes away. And now we just have our stars that are all moving. That's pretty good, right? Um, I claim that something will go wrong if I run this again. Can anybody tell me? Something's not going to work if I click go right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Very good. So you see now that that original star, because of like I let the program run to get to here, that original star hit itself. And so now if I click the green flag, it's going to create 50 clones of that star. And well, the original one was hidden, the clones are hidden too. All right, there's a couple ways to get around that. You could, uh, you could always tell the clones to show themselves, or you could just like make sure the original one is always always shown at the start. That's that's your other option. Maybe that's the easier one. But yeah, that's gonna work. That's gonna do it. And they're gonna just be floating around in space in different sizes. I think that's very very satisfying. And then the original one goes away and hides itself once it's done its job. Okay, so this is the clones program. Uh, the original star was just like copying itself 50 times, cloning, and hiding. All right? Any questions about that? That's pretty nice. All right? Um, the last thing I want to do is, like, to give the illusion of distance and warp speed or whatever, let's make the stars that are smaller more transparent, because, like, you know, the things that are farther away in our atmosphere should be, like, a little see-through, and same with stars, right? So let's make the stars that are smaller more Remember that uh, that has to do with what was called the ghost effect. All right, so what we're going to do for each star based on its size is we're going to change the ghost effect. Or set the ghost effect. So remember that uh, this is a number between 0 and 100 is like a percentage value. 100% ghost is invisible. 0% right? ghost is perfectly visible, opaque. And then 50% is like halfway transparent. All right. So that's kind of what we want to do. And we want the stars that are smaller, the stars that are smaller, to have bigger ghost effect. Does that make sense? That's kind of that's we're gonna to have to do a calculation here. All right. So like that needs to go there, and we need to put something here. We'll figure it out. All right. So based on the size, we can actually get our own size. Here's a size variable that's useful. Uh, we're gonna set the ghost effect to something involving our size. So let's kind of like break this down. So if if the size is 100%, uh, then that star is like as close as it could be. That's as big as the size was allowed to even be. Okay. So if the size is 100, like we should make sure that the ghost effect is zero. All right? Set the ghost effect to like 0%, something like that. Uh, so that's good. That's one example. And then maybe if the size was all the way down to the smallest, if the size was what was it, 35%, I want to set the ghost effect to be like transparent, but still visible. So maybe I can, uh, thinking about this ahead of time, maybe this could be like 65%. Because you kind of see what I could use, like size is a variable. Size is a variable. I can use that in a calculation. Uh, do you see how I could, like, if it was 100, I could make ghost zero. And if it was 35, I could make ghost 65. There's like a, a calculation going on there. This is, this is kind, of, kind of what I want to do. Like, set it to 100 minus size. The idea. All right, so set ghost effect to uh, 100 minus size. You see how when it's when the size is 100, the ghost effect will be zero. So it's not invisible, perfectly visible. Uh, and then if the size was the smallest, 35%, then we're going to do 100 minus that to get 65% transparency, all right? And that's going to be as transparent as possible for us, okay? So that's the calculation. That's kind of how I thought about it. And so now, just like, I want to set the ghost effect to something involving the size, so a subtraction. Subtract uh, 100, or subtract size from 100. That's kind of how you say it, right? 100 minus size is what we calculate. And now, the original star is just cloning itself still. Drumroll. Look at it. It's beautiful. See how the smaller stars are more transparent because of this like inverse kind of calculation that we were doing with the ghost effect. That's super cute, I think. Like transparent. They're smaller. So that means they're farther away, so they should be less visible. I like it. Okay. So yeah, that original star is cloning itself. There it goes, and then. Everybody else is just like that. It's a lot of original size stars, aren't there? Not very random. Different every time, though. So yeah, every cloned star goes to a random spot, uh, tilts in a random direction, so that it can move in a random spot, random way, right? And then sets a random size, sets the ghost effect to something involving the size, so that it's more transparent at the smallest. And then, yeah, just forever move a little bit, nudge it a little bit, 
and then bounce off the edge if you ever hit the edge like that one just there. This one comes out too. Bam. Cool. So yeah, I think that's the first example. Cloning. Cloning sprites is a possibility. Right? Any questions about this program? Pretty cool. We'll save that. So, all right, what do we want to do next? Well, let me stop this first of all. Uh, I think I want to do message passing now. So there's a, there's a concept. I'll, I'll, re I'll remake that ghost example. Do you, believe, do you believe in ghosts example from last time? Uh, I'll make it better and in, in a cleaner way because we did something silly uh, there. But I want to teach you the concept of message passing. That's a thing in Scratch. Uh, it's just a programming paradigm. So this is kind of the idea. There is, in Scratch, the, you have the ability to like send messages to other sprites. So like there's a concept of a sender and a listener. You can have multiple listeners. Uh, so like there's, there's one sender sending stuff, and then other people are listening. They're listeners, all right? They're listening to your stuff. So like the idea is like we're going to ask the user, hey, do you believe in ghosts? And maybe that'll be the Scratch Cats program. And then if they do believe in ghosts, we're going to have the Scratch Cat shout out a message to the ghosty sprites, right? So this is the Scratch Cat. And then we got, like, the other sprites can be listeners. Whee! We got, what was it? The skeleton, the ghost, and the bat. They can be listening for all the messages that the Scratch Cat sends, and, like, they'll just, like, send us a little message, post postcard, stamp it, and uh, they'll get to, they'll hear it. And then we can have those sprites respond to that message and act accordingly. Okay, so that's going to be the, the idea. So that's the concept of message passing and programming. So you got like, there's a sender, the sender can send messages, and anybody who wants to listen to that message can like subscribe to the feed or something of that message. So that's what we'll do. All right, so I'll recreate the ghost example with this in mind. And so I'll go to file name. Wee. Blank slate. And now uh, it's going to be, I think it's in sensing? No, no, no. It's in control. It's a broadcast. There it is. It's in events. So a message as far as Scratch is concerned is, uh, is an event. It was a broadcast a thing. Broadcast in waves. And then when I receive a message, do something with it. Cool. And we'll make our own messages, of course. So that's the goal. That's where we're going. All right. So let's set the scene again. Sprite one, we rename you as Scratch Cat. I just like to. And then we had like a woods backdrop. There it was. Scratch Cat was over here asking us questions. And then we had, uh, what was it? It was a skeleton, a ghost, and it was a bat. Cool. So there are my scary sprites. And now, we'll do most of the same thing. Uh, so the Scratch Cat was kind of like driving everything. When the green flag gets clicked, let's have the Scratch Cat ask us, do we believe in ghosts? And wait, and then we get the answer, right? And then like based on the answer, we did one thing or another thing, didn't we? So it's like if the answer was yes, then we like showed the ghost. So let's like get that set up, and we're going to do it a little bit differently this time. Though. So if the answer was like yes, then do something. Uh, but we're going to do it with messages this time. All right. So here's the secret. Here's the here's the new trick. We are going to broadcast messages. And so if you, you drag out a broadcast thing from events, a broadcast block, you can go to message one. It's like a default message that I don't know how to save the or change the name of. But like I guess that always exists. I'm going to go to new message, right? And I'm going to make two messages that the ghosts will be able to listen for. I'll call it uh, show ghosts. That'll be one message. And then I'll make another new message called hide ghosts. All right? And you kind of get the idea for each of them. Like when we shout this out, it's like the scratch cat yelling, hey, ghosts, hide yourselves. Hey, ghosts, show yourselves. And they can listen for that. So like at the start of the program, make sure the ghosts are hidden. And then if the answer was yes, go yell at the ghosts, broadcast to them, go show yourself. Does that make sense? Like we're talking to them. That's kind of how that's working. Right? So 
the ghost should start out hidden now. And I don't even need an else, like I kind of said last time. It's just like, if the answer was yes, then we need to show them because they were hidden at the start. Okay? They should start out hidden, though. So this is like the scratch cat shout and stuff. Does that make a little bit of sense, at least? It's pretty cool. Uh, this is a concept I don't even get to teach in, like, any other computer science class here. It's a very... Like, Scratch is pretty cool. Like, it has some fancy concepts that I don't even teach in under division, under uh, lower division computer science. So, cool. All right, so now we have these when I receive blocks. That's the secret now. So when I receive hide ghosts and when I receive show ghosts, I'm in, the go I'm in like, the skeletons program right now. They want to be listening to these, right? And then, like, anybody who is listening will, like, drag out one of these and they'll, they'll have code to run when they get this message is, is the idea, okay? So, like, what do I want to do for the skeleton if somebody shouts out, hide ghosts? Well, it's a ghost, so it should hide itself. And, again, what do I want to do as the skeleton if somebody shouts out and I'm listening for the show ghosts message? I want to show myself, yeah? That's, that's what the skeleton should do. That's also what the ghost and the bat should do. It's like, whenever you receive these messages, you guys, you should show yourselves if you heard the show ghosts message hide yourself if you heard the hide ghost message. And so in theory, I have copied both of these and it did not work. All right, so it's hide ghosts. Does that one work better? Oh no, it was there, Never mind. It was there, it was just hidden. So are you hidden? Of course you are. Scratch, scratch is weird sometimes. But yeah, there, I've given the same two programs, essentially, uh, the same two responses to those new events to those ghosty sprites, okay? And so kind of this is the idea, right? When the, when the green flag gets clicked, we're gonna shout out the Scratch Cat, it's its program. The Scratch Cat will shout out, hey ghosts, hide yourselves. And each ghost is hooking into that message. It's like, when I receive hide ghosts, oh, okay, I, knew, I know I need to hide myself. And then likewise, if we ever say yes, that we believe in ghosts, we'll say the Scratch Cat will shout out, essentially, show ghosts. And all the ghosts who are listening, they have this little event going on. They're going to receive the message, and uh, they will show themselves. Right? And each each of these three guys have that same program going on. All right? So if I click the green flag, bam, the ghosts are hidden because it's stopping on the ask block. Right now we have to type. Okay? So they all received that message, and they ran their hide block. Isn't that neat? And then if we say no, they stay hidden, of course, because the answer was no. We never hit the body of the if block. Uh, but... If I rerun it and I say, yes, yes, I do believe in ghosts, then they show themselves. Isn't that so cool? So they were all, like, hooking into this. Now they got the show ghost message. They heard that. Somebody somebody shouted it out. They heard it. And then they went and ran the, uh, the code that they needed to run. That was programmed into them whenever they got that message. Okay. Are there any questions about that concept? It's, uh, it's both very, very fancy and also kind of, not too horrible to understand, I hope. It's a very powerful concept in, compu in computer science, though, if you'll believe me. Yeah, that's message passing. Any questions about this program? I think that was pretty cool. So yeah, uh, if you remember the old program, it was a lot dumber, right? We made a variable that was like should show ghosts, and we were setting it to either one or zero. It's like we're using a variable that held a number, and then to these skeletons, ghosts, and bats, they were just like, they were making the computer warm because we had a forever loop. They were just kept on like every split second checking if that variable's value changed, and it was only able to change once. So this is a much cleaner way to do the program, in my opinion. It's like, all right, they're just waiting for this, and then if they see it, they'll run the code, and then they're done. Like, nobody's waiting in, in a forever loop right now, which is very, very nice. Okay, so uh, here is that code, copied and pasted. Make the original. Uh, let me recreate what it needs to be here. There. More or less, that's the program. There we go, that's how we did it this time. I'd like you, we got plenty of time, I'd like you to take a few minutes, I'll give you like a five minute timer or something, and uh, recreate this if you haven't already. And if you have some extra time, and you should, then try to change it around a little bit. Maybe like make the ghosts all say boo once they come out once they show themselves. You kind of see where you might hook into that. Uh, or like add new responses, like respond to 
the answer, like, maybe. Like, maybe if, the, if the answer wasn't yes, maybe the answer was maybe. Go and check for that. And uh, then, like, show half the ghosts or something. I don't know. You might need a new message for that. So, uh, yeah, think about your options. I'd be happy to help you if you have an idea and you're not sure how to do it. I can give you some pointers. But, yeah, just play around with this. These new concepts, I think that is uh, a good idea. Maybe you can combine, honestly. You could combine uh, cloning and message passing. So, like, show 100 ghosts. Right. How about that? Have them all be floating around, kind of like the star example. We got plenty of time. Go crazy. Uh, and then we'll come back. more minutes to play around. Maybe you can have the, the scratch cat be ganged up on by the ghosts if you say that you don't believe in them.
All right, that is my timer. Were any, uh, did any questions come up as we were trying it? I can answer. Can you all start working? Make something cool. That is, that's the spirit. That is how we learn new things. So, okay, I think I just want to show you one last thing, and that's going to take a bit of time, though. Uh, I'd like to make that game Pong. Have we heard of Pong, by the way? It's like one of the first video games. Hopefully you've seen it before. But the idea of, like, you've got a little... Uh, usually it, it was originally a two-player game, right? I'm just going to make a one-player version. But you got a little paddle on the left. It's like virtual ping-pong, I guess. And you got a little ball. And then the ball, like, moves around. You want to move the paddle to, like, hit the ball and it bounces off. I, I hope we've seen this before. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of, like, the goal. And so if we move it in time, then the ball should bounce off and go, like, boop, boop, boop. And if we ever, if we ever miss it, we if it goes down there, that's when we lose the game, right? So, like, that is what we're going to program right now. It's going to be great. Okay. So, uh, let us set the scene. I think I need to save this program so that you can have it later. Also give you Pong, of course, but let's now I can clear it out and not worry about it. Uh, that's another one of those programs that does not require the Scratch Cat. Goodbye, Scratch Cat. Sorry. Um, so you can pick whatever backdrop you like. I'll just keep it white, probably. Um, but we need a ball. There it is. There's a ball sprite. There should also be a paddle sprite. There it is. It's the wrong way, though. Uh, we'll fix that. And then... Uh, for reasons, we're going to need a third sprite. Uh, I guess I'll add it later. This is good enough for now. So first of all, this paddle is a little wonky. Let's change its direction. So it's perfectly up and down. So if it's 90 right now, it's like make it zero. That's good. And then it's kind of small. Let's change its size to like 150. Is that enough? I don't know, 175? That's more normal in my mind. So yeah, we got a ball, we want to move it, move it around, and we want the paddle to be able to go up and down. Um, let's see. Cool, let's see what we got first. So uh, we could, we could do this, right? We could have our events, we could be like, when the up arrow is pressed, when the down arrow is pressed. Like, move the paddle up and down, up and down. We could do that, but we will not do that. Okay. Instead, I think it would be more fun and it's like easier to play if we took advantage of the mouse. So here's what we'll do. We're going to make the paddle follow wherever the mouse pointer is. That'll be kind of interesting, right? You can always get, um, let's go to the paddles program right now. So what I'll do when we start the game, I'll forever be watching where the mouse is. So is that in sensing? So here's a cool thing. You get two variables about the mouse in your program. You get the x-coordinate of where your mouse is. Like, if my mouse is here, it's like at 0, 0. If it's over here, it's like the x is like negative 50 or something, and the y is still 0 because it's in the middle of the screen. So there's always a coordinate of where my mouse is right now. All right? There's always that. And if I would like the paddle to go up when I move the mouse up and down when I move the mouse down, here's what I'll do. I will make sure that the paddle's location corresponds, essentially, to the mouse X and the mouse Y. I'm going I'm to get rid of one of these in just a second, but let's just do both for now. It's like, go to this position. Uh, sorry, forever. I need to continuously watch the mouse because the mouse location is going to change. Forever, uh, paddle, go to wherever the mouse is and wherever the mouse is. Mouse X and mouse Y, whatever they are. Whee! And so when I run the program, do you see how I'm moving the mouse and the paddle is just following that mouse? Isn't that cute? I like it. Does that make sense what's going on here? Just forever watching the mouse uh, x and y coordinates. You're using the variables and the values change because I'm moving the mouse. And like whatever they are, set that paddle, because that's its program right now, set that, uh, its coordinates to that. Yeah? Does that make enough sense? It's pretty cool. Uh, I'll stop it so it stops following it. But honestly, I just wanted to go up and down. Like if I move the mouse over here, but it's still up a little bit, I just wanted to follow the mouse in the up and down direction. Does that make sense? So like don't ever change the x coordinate of the paddle, that's fine, just keep it a little bit away from the wall, but change the y coordinate only. Is that, you kind of see what we're going to do there? So instead of moving the x ever, I want to change, I want to set the y, set the y to mouse y, never change the x. And that's what I want to do. There's a set y only button. And so now, 
when I run the program, it's forever watching the mouse. It doesn't matter where the mouse is in terms of X, because we're not hooking into that. But you see, as I move the mouse up and down, like the Y coordinate is changing, and it's setting the Y coordinate of the pedal to match. So that's better. So now it's only ever going to move up and down, even if I'm way over here. Any questions about that and why it's working? That's pretty nice, I think. All right, so that's step one. Uh, what else? Move it back down, I guess, whenever, whenever you're done. Uh, I would like to have the ball just, like, move around. Okay, that'll be useful. So the ball, we need a program for the ball. So when the ball begins its life, when the game starts, when the green flag gets clicked, what would we, want, what would we like to do with the ball? Well, we'd like it to just, like, move around, right? Just, like, forever. Just like we were doing for the stars. All that forever ball move in your current direction, and then like if you ever hit the wall, bounce off. Yeah, that's kind of what we want to do with the ball. Whee. So this is the ball's program running, and it's just like all right, go in your current direction, bounce off. Hit the wall forever, do that. Okay, so that's normal. But this is kind of like a boring game right now. First of all, we haven't hooked in the ball and the paddle together. We'll get to that. But uh, right now, if like I stop and I rerun it, uh, it's just doing the same thing. Left and right, left and right, left and right. Uh, it's not very random. That's not very cool. So, step one uh, for the ball should really be pick a random direction, yeah? Because then the game will be different every time. Pick a random direction uh, for that ball. And then also a random spot. Pick a random spot as well as a random direction. So let's do that. So, hey ball, at the beginning of your life, go to a random position. And then also point in a random direction. So point in direction, uh, like we did before, is 0 through 360, any possible degree. So that makes sense? Now it would be different every time. I click it. It's like, okay, it's starting that way. That was kind of close to what it was before. Uh, but now it's going up and down. We'll eventually get to, to us. But like that's a different game. That's a different game. Yeah. That's a different game. So that's better. Yeah. Uh, one thing, though, Eventually, we're going to hook up the paddle with the ball. One thing that's a little unfortunate right now is that. Did you kind of see it? Like, the ball started its life, like, way over here. And it was moving towards the wall, and the paddle wasn't there yet. It's like, it would have been immediate game over if we let that happen. So, see, just like that or something. There is, there's the possibility, like, the random position was about to hit the wall, and just to be immediate game over. And so... I think instead of that, let's let's make it so that like let's make the game winnable and not just like game over at the start. So I think what I'll do is I'll put the ball in a random position, but I will force that random position of the ball to be on the right side of the screen. Because then even if it's gonna face this way initially, then it still has time to get there. Right? It's not just gonna like work right here. I'll make sure that the, if, if we want it to be on the right half of the screen, it's the X coordinate that really matters. The X coordinate of that ball, let's make sure it's always positive, because like this is 0, 0, essentially. Let's make sure it's a positive X, because then it's guaranteed to be on the right side of the screen. Uh, the Y can be positive or negative, that doesn't matter. Okay, so that uh, should make it better. So now, instead of going to a random position, it's going to be like, go to a specific X and Y coordinate that we will choose randomly. All right. Randomly with some conditions attached, with some strings attached. Like I'll, I'll drag out two pick randoms here. So the Y could be anything. It could be all the way up to here, like 165, or no, what is this, 150, 142, yeah, 150. Let's say 150 uh, at, the, at the max Y and like negative 150 for the min Y, so top or bottom. But as far as left or right are concerned, uh, the X value should only be positive. So let's start it at either like all the way from zero I guess non-negative is the right answer. 0 to 215, I don't know. Something like that. That will be a little bit better. Does that make sense? Because now we're, we're guaranteed to be on the right half of the screen if we do it that way. I think that'll be better. Uh, it's kind of hard for you to see, though. So here, look, I can split it up. Just like this is fine. This works, but you can't really see it. So I'll just do like a set X, set Y kind of thing instead of it, both of those. And you can see actually my code. So there. 
no, no real difference, just like now you can see it all. It's just doing it separate. Set the x to this, never negative, set the y to this. And then it's guaranteed, no matter how many times I click this, no matter which direction it eventually chooses, even if it's to the left, it's always going to be on the right half. See that? That's real nice. And so that gives us a winnable game. Like, we will eventually be able to, to make it work. Okay? Any questions about this so far? So that's the ball program. Start yourself off in a random spot on the right side of the screen. Is that a comment for that? Make sure the ball starts on the right half of the screen. And so that's x coordinates that suddenly matter. Could be up or down on the right side of the screen, so y can still be negative, but x cannot be. Okay, point in a random direction, so it's like a different game every time. And then uh, forever, ball, you've You've chosen your spot and your direction. Move in that direction and bounce off the edge if you ever get to one. Okay? So, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Now we need to make the paddle hooked up to the ball so that the paddle can hit the ball. Okay? And then it needs to bounce off. So, uh, there is a block for that. So, let's... Uh, whose job do we want this to be? I guess because of the ball. The ball is already checking and seeing if it's on an edge and bouncing. Let's also have it check and see if it's hitting, if it's hitting the paddle and, and then bounce. That seems like another job that the ball could do. So in here, in this front loop, if you're on the edge bounce as well as if you ever hit the paddle bounce. So uh, we're going to need an if there. Uh, and I'll show you what we need for if it's instancing. All right. Do you remember this with the fish example? So it's, uh, go back to the balls program though. There's this touching block. Is is it uh, is the ball touching whatever you want it to check? Is it touching the paddle? Right. So right now it's false because they're far away from each other. But if the ball were right here, then it would be true. See that? And that's how the ball can check if it's touching the paddle. We use this little uh, condition here. Right. So if that's true, then we want to bounce off. Does that make sense? So that's perfect. That's exactly what we need here. And so now the question is, what do we want to have happen if the ball touches? The how do we make it bounce off? Because like this, if on edge bounce was kind of like doing a lot at once, we have to kind of program that ourselves. So like, let's make it easy. I'll, I'll show you the complicated way or the fancier way uh, in the future, but not today. But let's say this is what we want to have happen. So let's say the ball is coming in to the paddle like that. Um, know that like honestly what we really want is it to bounce off that way but that's going to be a weirder calculation that i don't want to deal with right now so let's just say if the ball hits the paddle i would like it to bounce off just like that opposite direction and we can get that very easily couldn't we we can like take our current direction add 180 to it that'll flip us around yeah no matter where we are so let's say if we ever hit that if the ball and the pedal ever touch that means the ball touched the paddle uh okay Bouncing off as a change in direction of the ball. Yeah. Because then it, it'll get a new direction that's 180 away. It's exactly opposite of where it came from. It'll just zoom off the other way, and then we can do it all over again. Unless we lost. Okay. So that, that I think is going to be what I want to do here. So if the ball is touching the paddle, like it just checked if it was on the edge. If it was on the edge, we're still going, right? Uh, if it's touching the paddle now, though, on this frame or whatever, uh, then... I would like to make that ball bounce off. All right, so I'd like to change its direction. Point in, point in direction, something new. Uh, is there, or honestly, it's going to be a turn, essentially. It's going to be a turn by 180 to either direction, because it's the same, right? Turn by 180. Does that make sense? That's what I want it to do. If the ball is ever touching the paddle, make a 180, because you just got hit, and you should bounce off. Okay? So that, uh, the paddle is just following the mouse, that's easy. But the ball is doing the bulk of the work here. So this is what happens if, uh, if the ball is the paddle, we know what to do now. So now, like, what is the ball doing? Let's, let's try to explain it all. It's setting the x, y to random position. So we have constrained in a certain way. We're getting a random direction for the ball. Uh, and then whatever, uh, and then forever, what do we do? The ball. Move a little bit in your current direction. Move a tiny bit, 10 steps. If you are on the edge, bounce off. If you're touching the paddle, bounce off of that. We have it. 
Just gonna keep on doing that, all right? Move 10 steps, move 10 steps, move 10, te move, move 10 steps until something happens like this. Then if touching pal is true, I'm gonna run this and like change its direction. 180, 180, 180. Keep on going 10 steps, 10 steps. Eventually it'll also hit the wall and like bounce off of there. Okay, so that's what's happening. And look at it work. Wee, the second it hits it, it touches it, it bounces off, goes in the opposite direction. It does a 180, which is not exactly what it should be. It should be like going up a little bit that time, but uh, we will fix that. Okay, we'll fix that eventually. Uh, maybe you can think about how you might fix it, but it seems to be working. <coughs> Are there any questions about what we got right now? We got a very complicated ball program essentially, but it's working. That's pretty cool, huh? Uh, yeah, if we're still good, if we're still satisfied, uh, do you yell at me if you can think of any questions? But we still have something key left to do, right? We need to lose the game. You see how the ball just hit the side right there? Like, I should have lost the game right there. So let's, let's make sure that happens, all right? So what we want to do is essentially make the game stop once we lose, all right? There's a stop block for that. We'll run it. But uh, let's, let's make that happen right now. So the easiest way to determine... If the ball has hit the wall, like you could do another if. You could be like, if the ball's uh, x coordinate has turned into exactly negative 225, you could do that. Uh, but honestly, it's easier to just add a new sprite. There's a sprite called, uh, I think it's called line. Yeah, there's a line sprite, which we can turn from 90 degrees to 0 degrees. And just like put right here. It's kind of cheating, but like, see if I put that right there. Right there, please. Slump right there. Cool. See how now um, I can do a touching kind of computation. If the ball is touching that line, then it's game over. That's easier. Then you don't have to fiddle with coordinates. So uh, we can make that line's job. This is the new sprite. It's called line. It, it can be in charge of figuring out if the game's over or not. So when the green flag gets clicked, what the line should do to just keep on forever checking and seeing if the ball is hitting it. Yeah, if it is, we need to stop the game. So forever, keep on checking and seeing, like, it's always from the perspective of the current block that you're writing the program for. So this is the lines program. So this is now a, a, a touching question from the perspective of the line. Like, is the line touching the basketball? Is the line touching the ball? Okay. And that is going to uh, need an if block. So if the line is touching the ball, if that is true, then it's game over. Okay. Game over, if true. So, yeah, there's a nice little block that just, like, stops the game. Stops the entire program. as it, it essentially clicks the stop block for you. Um, that is right here in control. It's in stop all. Uh, I don't know if I showed you this before, did I? I don't remember. But it's, it's kind of cute, because if you, you kind of see that, like, there's nothing that could go below the stop block, because it's going to stop the program, which is very, very nice. I love the way that they did that. Just like a straight line. Can't hook into anything else below it. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So now, when the green flag gets clicked, uh, the ball and the power will do their normal thing. But now the line is checking, right? When the green flag gets clicked forever, the line will be checking, hey, am I touching the ball right this split second? So just keep checking that. It'll be false usually. But eventually, once you lose the game, it will become true. Like touching ball is true. Like right now, right now it's false. But if it gets to here, then it's like and it's true, and once it's true, then we are going to run our stop block, which is just going to click the stop button, essentially, and stop the game. Question? There it is. Uh, let's see. There's always a way. Let's see, what's the easiest way to do it? I don't actually think there's a way to programmatically click the green flag. Um, so... I think maybe the easiest way to do it would be to use messages and just like send message restart game or something and have code that hooks into that that like does it all over again. And then when the green flag gets like, like when you start the game, then you can send that message again. Like that's just how you start the game from then on. That's kind of how you can how you might do that. Uh, good question. Any other questions before I show you this working? So in theory, we've hooked it up right. Now it's still gonna bounce off, just like everything else. That's the ball's job, but now the line is I'm going to keep checking this. You can't what? Oh, yeah, you 
You could add points as well every time it hits. Or, yeah, that's exactly right. So you could uh, you could add that into this because if if the ball is touching the paddle, that means you just hit it. And maybe you can give it a point. Yeah, good. So yeah, you can keep track of points. With that. You'll need a variable for that. These are cool ideas that I encourage you all to try. So there's that. Uh, yeah, now the game is losable. <laughs> cool. So yeah, you see how like hits that line. It notices that it's touching here, then it stops the game. Okay. Any other questions about that before I make it slightly, slightly fancy? Okay, one last thing is uh, let's just make like a little banner to display once we lose just to make us feel bad about ourselves. Let's make a use, you lose sprite uh, that will be displayed, will be hidden by default, but shown to uh, just make fun of the user once they lose. Okay, so I'll make a new sprite. And uh, instead of clicking the choose a sprite, I will click out uh, the paint button so I can make my own sprite. So I'll, I'll just go to text and be like, you lose, sad face, something like that. And then you can draw whatever you want, it honestly doesn't matter. But I'll just make this big, Whee! put it right there, bam. And uh, yeah, this is in the costumes tab right now, I can go back to the code tab. And by default, this is called sprite one, apparently, but we can call it you lose or whatever you want it to be want it to be called so uh, let's see we would like this message or we would like this sprite this message to be displayed uh, whenever we lose the game and then just like hidden by default so we could do the same thing that we did with the ghosts example we could uh, make that you lose sprite uh, get displayed via a message That'll be great. It's like a game over message or something. I think that'll work. So let's see here. Yeah, when the green flag gets clicked, this you lose sprite should always be hidden. Right at the start of the game, it should always be hidden. So I'll hide it. But then if we ever lose the game, let's make a new message and it can be like it's, uh, it's the line sprites program that's noticing this. So let's go to uh, events, and then we'll make a broadcast message. So we'll make a, uh, I don't want it to be called message one, so I'll make a new message called like game over. And then it will shout out that to anybody who wants to listen. And it'll be this you lose sprite that's listening. All right. So if I go to, you see how this is what's going to happen. Whenever the ball touches the line, if that's true, then broadcast the game over message. And that little you lose sprite is going to hook into that and show itself. Like by default, it'll be hidden. But the second we say broadcast game over, it'll hook into that and show itself. It'll be cute. Uh, and then, then we stop the entire game. So I'll, I'll make sure everybody stops moving and all that. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what I want to have happen. And now we just need to hook into the game over message for this you lose sprite. It's so like when I receive the game over message, uh, I just want to show this. Uh, and so that just requires one block there. Cool. So, yeah, let's try it again. Let me lose the game. Yay, and it displays you lose. Because, like, it noticed, broadcast that, and this was listening by default. Start out hidden, and then it showed itself when it saw that. Okay, that's the trick. There it is, and it's working. I like it. And I think that is my complete phone program that I wanted to show to you. Are there any questions about uh, any of this new stuff? Message passing all over again. All right, if we are good, uh, oh yeah, I promised to stop the attendance. There we go. Uh, if we are good, I need to save this so you can have it later. And then, um, yeah, that's the end of the lecture part. I just want to give you your next programming assignment, and then there's time for you to get started if you want. All right, so this will be due next week. Uh, but you have slightly longer because I usually give you just one week, right? But now it's like a week and a couple days because this is a Monday. That's quite nice. So here's what I want you to do if you've never programmed before. If you're on the Scratch program side of things, I'd like you to code up this Space Invaders game. This is a, a fun little tutorial from somebody on the internet. They made this video. Go watch that video. And it'll just walk you through. I don't know if I can like mute myself. I don't want to like display because like, here, let me pause this recording. So just for the people who are watching this all over again, you're just either doing Space Invaders or this, and you're recording a video. Cool. Uh, I think that's all that I wanted to record.
All right.